Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Sirs Group podcast. I'm JC. And I'm Barbara. And we are fresh back from the Sirs X conference we went to last weekend, weekend before. Yeah. Mid-July. Just keeps on going. <laughs> um, but when we were at Sirs X, we were listening, we went to every single talk. We were very studious. And at the end of every talk, I wrote a quick takeaway. So these are like fresh takes from the mind of JC at the time she heard the talk. Um, and so we thought what we would do is kind of recap our entirety, the entirety of our experience at Sirs X really quickly. And then what we're going to do after this is we're going to have a couple of themed episodes to go over the talks in more specificity about the different categories of topics like remediation, protocol, uh, kind of like adjunct topics to SIRS, um, and then kind of go from there. But one thing I did want to add is Barbara and I are not medical professionals. We are SIRS patients. We run a community of SIRS people, and we've read the textbook. We went to the conference. We have a lot of info about this, but nothing we say should be taken as medical advice ever. Always consult your SIRS certified practitioner. Who you could find at survivingmold.com. So uh, other disclaimer is this episode is going to be very like chatty mildly gossipy slumber party vibes so maybe buckle in grab a snack grab a drink that's the energy <laughs> we're bringing to this podcast today yes yeah, so it'll be a good time we um i mean we were exhausted at the end of sirs x like beyond there was lots of lots of late night hanging out and chatting but like long days of talk after talk after talk like these were solid days guys of 8 a.m. to like 6 30 p.m. like CME level uh you know practitioners for other practitioners speaking on things so it was it was a lot it was a lot and I would say if you have any if you're feeling any FOMO or like you wish you were there depending on where you are in your healing journey you want to be a you want to be a little further along on her on your healing journey for several reasons um, but one of which is just your, the concentration, the focus that all of that, the energy needed to be at a conference like this is um, a little bit strenuous. So, yeah, that's a really good disclaimer. Someone in our group asked, who is SIRS X for? And I would say it's really for the providers. It's for the remediators. It's for the SIRS professionals. And then I think if you're a very curious person and you, you're a SIRS patient and you're further along in your healing, exactly like you said, and you have the stamina for it, you might find it interesting, but really it's geared more towards those professional SIRS doctors, remediators. I think that was really the bulk of who was there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the other, the professionals also that are like us, their coaches mm -hmm. are also um, a really, or if you're thinking about being a coach, because I know a lot of people who go through this, pra this protocol, you have to learn so much just to go through it as a patient. You kind of feel like, well, I might as well put this uh, new knowledge to good use. Like, let me help other people get through this. So uh, there, there are um, some exciting things in the works uh, through SIRSX for specifically for coaches as well. So I think if you're interested in that, I mean, get, come on in. The water's fine. There's lots of need for uh, for coaching and helping people going through SIRS. So so if you're thinking about it, I definitely encourage you. And I would encourage you to go to SIRSX next year if you are. All right. So jumping into the talks, they started out strong. Screening for SIRS by Dr. Dorninger. Dr. And D. V. Dr. D. And Dr. Dorninger is uh, one of the co-founders of SIRS X along with Scott McMahon. So you're going to hear that name a little bit later. But my big takeaway from this talk, and it was really about that diagnostic protocol that we've talked about in the past. We can link an episode for you guys. Um, but the one thing that we're always told is if you fail the VCS test, you have a 98% chance that you have SIRS. And up until this point, we've kind of always been told like, oh, if you have SIRS, you'll fail the VCS test. But in practice, we have not found that to be true. There seems to be like a really high percentage of people who pass the VCS test, but still have the blood marker for SIRS. So it's not quite this reliable test that it's sometimes uh, claimed to be. And they actually gave a statistic 
Uh, so one of the providers did their own study in clinic that 50% of their patients were passing the VCS test, but still had the blood marker for SIRS. And when they kind of went into why they thought that could be is when Shoemaker was doing the studies around the, the patients uh, to see the fail rate of the VCS test, he was kind of working with the sickest of the sick. It was people who were exposed to fisteria and mold and, and, and chemical toxicity, like a bunch of stuff. And so his fail rate might have been higher. All to say, the big takeaway for me from this talk, and I'm sorry, I said I was going to do like a sentence per talk, and this has been like a monologue, is that the fail rate is actually quite high. It could be up to 50% of people pass the VCS test, but still have SIRS. Yes, that was really important. And the only thing I will add is that the main, the topic of the talk was screening for SIRS. And Dr. D has a vision for the world of practitioners that there are screeners and then there are screeners and treaters. And I think that there's a, so much value in even just being a screener. Like, so if you're a practitioner watching this and you don't necessarily want to treat SIRS, you don't want to go down that rabbit hole. If you can at least learn the questions to ask uh, patients and, and patients listening to this, if you can learn the questions to ask your friends or your family that you care about, what, um, like, if you ask the deeper questions than just, hey, has there ever been water damage in your home? Like most people are going to say no to that. But if you start to think like, well, have you ever like seen mold? Do you ever smell like a musty smell? Like if you start going down the different ways of asking things and figure out that aspect, um, that can be so useful. So you can direct people to the practitioners that do actually treat it. So I really liked that distinction that he made. Um, it kind of opens up the world of of net, the net that people can throw to to catch more people with SIRS so that they can get the treatment that they need. Yeah, that was a really great takeaway as well. The next talk was Why Buildings Fail to Protect Our Health by Paula Baker Laporte. And she builds buildings. Um, <laughs> she's an architect. And my biggest takeaway from this one was build it right the first time so that it's the last time. A lot of us have to experience remediation or moving because we are exposed to mold. And this talk was all about all of the different ways you can build a building in a way that you are reducing the risk to water damage. Yeah. And it's a shame. And I, I do have some background in construction. So I really enjoyed all of the construction related and remediation related talks. Um, but most people don't have that background. And it's crazy the number of ways that homes are built to code that means the government requires you to build it a certain way and it's actually perfect for mold to grow and so i think the more that we talk about all of this and get the word out hopefully the more things can change and the proper different and better building materials can be selected and used in the building process 100 percent. uh i have to out myself right now i really like older people like I joke that I was born 40 and I've just been getting older since but I've always like in every job I've ever had I've made friends with like the old ladies that I work with and I don't even mean like old I just mean like older than me so you're gonna hear me crush on like all of the old er people that we interacted with and so the next talk was my very own sirewall by Ming Dooley and she is adorable she actually built this sirewall and a sirewall it's a it's a it's a compacted dirt wall. Um, and over time it becomes stronger and stronger. And because it's just dirt, there's nothing that mold can grow in. And so it's like this building material that's really great for people who are sensitive to water damage. And my takeaway from this episode was that she was adorable and this felt really accessible. Like if you were, I feel like if you were thinking about building your own home, it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility to build your own sirewall. It would definitely be a very different process. And the cool thing with sirewall is they have a lot of resources and we'll get into this more when we do the specific episode about it. But it did feel like if Ming could do this, I could do this. Which is not an insult to Ming at all, uh, because I will say Ming can do this. She's a better person than I. Show me who I can hire. Uh, <laughs> that was my take. It was a lot of work. It was it was hard work. It is hard work to build those walls. Um, if you want to do it yourself, it's doable. 
absolutely doable, like you said, but man, that is like, you don't need to work out. Like that is a, a real workout in and of itself. But um, also she's like the mini mouse of SIRS. Like she's fantastic. She's adorable. Couldn't I agree love more. Her. Love her so much. <laughs> As soon as she walked on stage and her head didn't clear the podium, I was just like, I love you. <laughs> yes. So good. Then the next talk was uh, Sir Zek's work plan. And this was basically a remediation plan, but it was done by Cindy Edwards. And that name might sound familiar to people who are familiar with SIRS because she co-wrote the Mold Illness Surviving and Thriving book. My biggest takeaway from this was that the remediation plan has to be thorough. You have to look at all aspects of the building. She really focused on the HVAC system specifically in this talk. But then the second part of that is whatever plan you come up with has to be adhered to. So in the case study she shared, the person had switched contractors where they had decided to finish the project themselves. And by trying to skip those steps, they ended up kind of shooting themselves in the foot because they had to go back and remediate again. Ugh. Yeah, a lot of the remediation related talks involved, oh man, should have tested before you closed up all those walls, you know, or something, something terrible like that. So, so multiple testing. I mean, this goes for your, your body as well. Test before you move on to the next step. Test before you, you know, go to VIP. Test before you close up your walls uh, after you've done a bunch of work and you think that your house is clean. So yeah, that's that's important. The next talk was the anti-inflammatory benefits of the carnivore diet by our very own Judy Cho. And for my takeaway, all I wrote was carnivores bay. <laughs> yeah, I will um I will also freely admit I took zero notes during this talk because I mean this is what like I bought into this two and a half years ago. Like I'm I'm with you, Judy. She's the best. She knows what she's talking about. If you've seen any of her YouTube videos or talks you know you already know this as well uh but yeah carnivore people on carnivore seem to be faring better with treatment than people who are not i think that's the general her general uh findings amongst all of the many many clients that she has worked with who have SIRS yeah and she presented so much evidence too it was really interesting when we did the the panel discussion at the end of the day a lot of people were asking questions about diet because of Judy Yes. And this was exacerbated or uh, just, I guess that's the best word for it, uh, by the fact that we had not only a vegan on the same day give a talk, but also someone else who had done studies that specifically stated that meat was bad and like wine was good. And I trust me, I was dying many deaths during that talk. But we'll, you guys we'll... should have heard Barbara. I was sitting next to her and I just kept hearing <laughs> this drawn out size and it would make me laugh every time I sigh so loud guys oh, I sigh oh. so loud and I'm such a bitch sometimes <laughs> I feel like I don't hide it at all <laughs> that woman and I'm we were in the front row <laughs> I need you guys to know that I was so mad I was like this woman I'm gonna have a, some words anyway yeah anyway yes Judy did a great job that's the moral Absolutely. of the story. <laughs> the next talk was next gen sequencing more than an actinobacteria. And this was by David Lark. He wasn't there in person. Unfortunately, he had a family emergency, but he pre recorded something for us. And this was a very, so I work for a software company and I very often talk with engineers. And it's like they're talking about something in the middle of a sentence where you don't have the context for everything they talked about before and they just start in the middle of the sentence because you don't know all of the like engineering lingo they're saying. That is 100% how I felt during this talk. However, I think I got the main point. He was doing a bunch of testing on environments to see what was going on, um, if it was just actinos or just mold, etc., and he found that when he did this testing, there's something other than actinos that are kind of spiking the actinos marker on the envirobiomics test. So it's other than actinos, but it appears to also be 
taken care of by the actinos cleaning. So even though it's a bacteria, we haven't quite identified what it is yet. It's still taken care of by the actinos cleaning. So I don't want anyone to freak out about like new scary thing. It's like, no, this is also taken care of by the actinos cleaning. But it's interesting because I think more and more we're just going to find out you know, what SIRS is caused by and the more nuance we can get, the more targeted we can be in our approach. Yeah. I, I think the only thing that it didn't bother me about the talk, but it was very speculative. There were a lot of questions at the end and more questions than answers. But like you said, the, you know, the nice thing is at least we don't really have to do anything differently. It's still cleaning. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, I remember not taking a ton of notes on that one either. Cause he was just kind of posing some questions and then explaining things without explaining things. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, it was cool. Cause this feels like the leading edge of SIRS, right? Yes. Like we have the, these ongoing studies, we have this ongoing research. And even though we still have these questions, it's really cool that we're still asking them. We're not letting things just be good enough as they are like these practitioners these remediators these scientists are like constantly pushing the envelope to see how they can help patients heal excellent excellent point on that because yeah it's um otherwise it feels a little bit like when someone says oh i got blood work today and you're like (laughs) oh (laughs) but when are you okay let me know when you get the results (laughs) (laughs) It's a little like that, like, oh, cool. I'm glad that you did that step. I'm glad that you're asking these questions, but like, maybe, maybe come back to us when you got more answers too also, but I'm, but good job. (laughs) So hopefully he speaks again next year, but that was, that's exactly what it felt like. It was like, (laughs) oh, we got this cool research, but uh, we're still researching. Right. The next talk was the immunomodulatory effects of camel milk for SIRS patients with ASD. And this was by Dr. Jody Deshore. And ASD is autism for any autism spectrum disorder, I think is what it stands for. Mm -hmm. Um, But I know you have a lot to say about this one, Barbara. I just had one quick takeaway. Um, That animal protein is healthy, especially when it's targeted. And the reason I said that was because Jody uh, typically... She's plant-based, and I believe that she encourages her patients to be plant-based as well, with the exception of camel milk. So even vegans believe that you have to have some animal protein, and I thought that was so cool, but go ahead. No, I mean, you have the better viewpoint on this, and I thought it is fantastic that a vegan, of all people, is giving an entire talk on the benefits of an animal product, first of all. It was so good. That said... Just eat meat. Like, like, just do that. Like, that's another option. Um, Now I get it. You know, maybe, maybe like, uh, if you, if you love animals in that particular way of like not wanting them to be killed, like, and directly eat their flesh. I never heard, I've heard a vegetarian tell me that once. Like, I get it. I get, and then, you know, you find a different thing. Like, oh, like she sourced her camel's milk from a farmer she personally knew who personally took care of those camel. Like she, like, I mean, as a vegan, you have, you know, like, like that's, that's, that's impressive. I will acknowledge that. Like that is the right way to do it. If you, if you are a vegan for those like animal saving or your spiritual beliefs, all of those reasons, at least you're sourcing your milk, you know, really well, but, um, just eat meat guys. You just eat meat. Camel's milk is really expensive. I did look into it. It It is expensive, but you know, when you see someone who's really passionate about something like those kids, you knew in elementary school where they're like, I'm going to be a doctor or veterinarian when I grow up. And I was always jealous of those kids. Cause I was like, I never, I was always like, I don't know. I could be anything, I guess. But when you see someone who's super passionate about something, it's like, geez, I wish I could be that committed to anything. The way this woman is committed to ethically sourcing camel milk. Yeah. No, I, I agree that the passion there is is there. And and she seems like a really like her demeanor was like very calm and gentle and like kind. I know that she's she must be a fantastic doctor. So I make jokes, but but I also, you know, she she does seem like she really knows what she's doing besides Absolutely. the meat part. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the next talk was new neurological applications of Jeannie Neuroquant and ALS. And this was by Dr. Richie Shoemaker. So the 
Dr. Richie Shoemaker of the Shoemaker Protocol fame. Um, and he, I didn't write a takeaway for this one. I did. Um, basically, can this data help inspire more research and help with early detection and direct treatment for people with ALS? Um, it was ALS, Parkinson's, and dementia that he was talking about, um, kind of implying that perhaps SIRS has some neurological effects. Um, but this was another one. I'm going to steal your verbiage. It was very speculative. At the end, there were just more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. um, so this is very, very new research as well. So this was end of the day Friday, and the Keystone talk was an integrative approach to Parkinson's, and this was by Dr. Lori Mishley. She, so she does Parkinson's research. So I had two takeaways for this one. One is that the people doing the best in her Parkinson's approach were not the purists. They were not the people who were going 100% all of the time. They were the people who had very balanced lifestyles. And then the second takeaway that I had was um, she said one of the number one indicators that you were going to progress and like just deteriorate from Parkinson's quickly was if you said you were lonely. And so I think that really speaks to joining a community. So I'm going to plug the SIRS group right now. It's a community of like-minded people who are healing from SIRS. And definitely if you... so the loneliness outcome for Parkinson's, but also loneliness is a indicator of health outcomes generally. And so anytime you can plug into a community of people who are going through the same thing, and then people who can be supportive of what you're going through, it's going to be a game changer for your health journey. Absolutely. It's, that is the, that, like, it blew me away, not because I was shocked or surprised, because it's it's not surprising at all. Of course, loneliness is this huge factor for health, but it's like so sad when you think about that. Um, and so, getting a getting a community, having having family, having friends, and and just keeping all of that, nurturing all of that for your whole life, your whole life is very very important. Um, but this is the talk that cited a mazillion quadrillion studies that showed eating meat is terrible and eating fruit and vegetables and wine is better for Parkinson's outcomes. Um, thankfully, as uh, JC already mentioned in the Q&A that day, which followed immediately after her talk because hers was the last of the day, um, Judy was up there too. And people brought that up. Like you just cited all of this stuff about how meat is bad. And Judy just talked about how meat is actually the best. So what's going on? So they had a chance to kind of hash it out in a really professional and kind uh, and courteous way while I was sighing and rolling my eyes in the front row. But, um, but the point that she made, actually, it's funny because she actually argued for, for what I think as well. Um, this, uh, what was her name? I forget her name. Dr. Lori Mishley. Dr. Lori Mishley. She said, um, you know, people who eat turkey were healthier than people who ate chicken. There's no reason that should be different other than she admits how we normally eat chicken, like chicken nuggets, fried chicken, breaded chicken, all of the things that aren't just chicken. You don't really eat you know, turkey nuggets and all of that. You're usually eating like, you know, uh, deli meat or or whatever. Um, like, yeah, roasted turkey or whatever. But anyway, she admits that there's no study that involves just eating meat. Like you are eating, oh, you're eating beef? Well, you're probably having it in the form of a cheeseburger with a bun and a soda and fries. And that's the results that they're getting. It's the same problem with all the epi epidemiology studies of like that have ever been done on like carnivore and showing why meat is bad. You never separate, most studies never separate the meat from all the other crap. So- I think she got the point. Um, she does have a, a link to join the Parkinson study. So if you have Parkinson's and are a carnivore, <laughs> she offered for people to join that uh, to basically show uh, their side of things. But I did make a joke from the front row that they don't exist. That's not true, I'm sure. But like if you're if you're carnivore long term, I think your chances of developing something like Parkinson's probably drops, but maybe it's me believing too hard in carnivore. I'm not sure. 
So that was end of day one, day two, very start. Um, it was called Slaying Water Damaged Dragons, a patient experience with water damaged buildings. And this was Chris Both and Aaron Pettigrew. And I didn't even write that down, but I remember it because after the talk, I went up to him and I was like, do you get asked about Peter Pettigrew all the time? And he was kind of like, I didn't even look at Harry Potter until everyone started freaking out about my name. And then I was like, okay, now I have to watch this. And I was like, I don't understand your lifestyle, but okay. Um, <laughs> this this was a really interesting talk because, again, most of the SIRSX uh, attendees were providers and remediators. They weren't patients. And so it was really cool that they brought patients up on stage to share their experience, especially people who had experienced like such a rough time with the remediation. These guys are like 100K, 250K in debt over all of this. And a lot of it has just been failings on the part of the practitioners and the remediators to communicate and make sure they had an appropriate plan and not have all these setbacks. Kind of what um, uh, Cindy Edwards was saying was like, you need a plan and then you need to follow that plan. And that just didn't happen in their case. So I think that one thing I would say is if you can have like a project manager for your remediation and just someone like Cindy Edwards, and there are people you can reach out to who can do this for you and you can find them on survivingwealth.com. It's even if it's ex expensive, quote unquote, in the moment to hire someone like that, not skipping steps is going to be the most efficient path towards you being in a safe environment and you healing every single time. Yeah. And yeah, their stories were very inspiring. I similarly very glad that patients uh, were brought in to talk about their experience, especially amongst all the practitioners who probably don't get to hear that level of like kind of venting a little bit um, from the patients that isn't it, without that pressure of it being your own patient. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I feel like that was probably really helpful. The other, the thing that it seemed to bring to light, which it looks like Dr. D himself is spearheading to fix is a protocol or a step-by-step -step protocol that remediators use or a home builder uses something that's in order no ambiguities. It's a thing that that remediators can follow. And it's it'll be similar to the shoemaker protocol. If a practitioner follows the shoemaker protocol to the T, people heal. So I think the same thing needs to be made for remediation. And it sounds like that is a problem that they are aware of and that is being addressed. So that's exciting. Absolutely. The next talk was in pursuit of underlying causes of contaminated buildings. And this was by Brandon Apple. And the takeaway I had was mold inspection is not formulaic. It takes investigation to be very thorough. So he kind of, um, at the beginning of the talk, he was like, I have this new, new tool and it can do a background check and a physical investigation and record moisture conditions and airflow and do all the testing and determine the cause. And, 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 and it was um, a joke. He was basically saying, like, in order to be a good remediator, you need to do all of these different things and you need to have this investigative approach. And it was just, um, I think for remediators, it was probably really good to hear that sometimes it's not one and done. And it's going to be interesting to see how Dr. Dorninger handles that in the remediation protocol is like, sometimes it's not ABC, sometimes it's ABC, BC, BC. Yeah. Yeah, my big takeaway from that one, which I mean, is huge for me with my own hurts me two score of four, they he showed a, a house that had a hurts me two score of four, and it was actually not okay. Um, and the point I think that he makes at the end is uh, just don't rely on one tool just because you have your hurts me two score. Cool. Okay. But like, look at it, look at the species of mold that showed up on that, that even gave you the score of four or whatever your score is. And then dig a little bit deeper. Like, what does that tell you? Because different species mean different things as far as like what the environment might be. So it, it just, it proved the reason why you would want to hire an expert and uh, an indoor environmental professional to actually read your score, read all of the report that you get with your Hurts Me Too or ERMI test, and then actually 
test elsewhere, test other ways, do, do some air sampling, do some cavity sampling. If you think a particular wall is a problem, uh, do some moisture detection, do thermal imaging. Like there's a lot of different tools that an IEP will use when they inspect your home. So don't rely on just one. The next talk was using peptide bonds and proteins to monitor cleanliness. And this was by the very adorable John Banda. So he's this little old man which I love. And on the day, the first day, he kind of participated in the panel discussion, like he was shouting from the back of the room and he was wearing this little newsboy cap. And I just could not, it was too cute. <laughs> and he was shouting in an appropriate way, like because he didn't have a mic. Like I, I feel yes. like that's necessary. <laughs> he wasn't just like, hey, like heckling the panel. Like he was adding useful information. <laughs> He's like, papers but... here, get your papers. <laughs> right. <laughs> My takeaway from this talk was that if a patient isn't getting better, more investigation is needed. A remediator's job isn't done when you're done remediating the home. Your job is done when the patient heals. Hey, this is Editing JC. So Barbara and I filmed this episode and we realized it was going to be much longer than we had anticipated. So we're going to split it into two parts. This is me closing out part one. You can join us next week for part two, where we finish recapping all of the different talks from Sir X. And then following this, we're still planning on having the categorized episode. So we'll have one all about the remediation talks and going into more detail there, et cetera. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you are looking for more resources and support on your search journey, you can join us over at thesearchgroup.com. We'll see you over there.